Welcome everyone to our webcast today, Basic Family Creation Using Autodesk Revit. Our speaker today is Martha Hollowell. Martha, the floor is yours. Thanks, Kareen, and welcome everyone to our webcast today. Um, what I'm going to be doing is taking some information from our Autodesk Revit 2015 BIM management course, and it's coming from Chapter 4 of the Family Concepts and Techniques. And this is actually one of my favorite chapters. I just love making families, so I'm glad to actually be sharing it with you today. Um, I am going to be covering some but not all of the information covered in this chapter because it is rather extensive and we don't have that much time. But I do want you to let you know there is more to it. Um, so if you are using our books in training, this will give you a good basis for what's going on. And if you don't yet have the book, you might want to get it for all the other neat tips and tricks that come through. So our goal for this webcast is to create a component family by establishing the parametric framework, adding solid elements, and creating multiple types of different sizes. So in, in our creating of the component family, we're going to actually do these three things, uh, these major things. We're going to use our uh, bookcase sample throughout this one, but for you guys who are MEP in structure, we have family examples as well in the book that takes you through all these various steps. So a heat pump for MEP and a, a trellis column is what we call it for structural. We also have chapters that are full of families. So we have a chapter that has a bunch of architectural families, another one is structural, another one uh, MEP. So it has other mechanical elements, uh, electrical elements, plumbing elements. So there's plenty of family information in the BIM guide. Well, let's take a look at the family creation workflow. The first thing you need to do when you're ready to make a component family is to select a template. Now, that template can actually be another family. So if you're doing something similar, say a door, you can use an existing door family and then copy it and modify it. So, but in a sense, it's a template. You're starting with something else. But most often, or not most often, but often, you will uh, select a template that comes with Revit. So in, in the templates, it comes with all the various things that you need to start the process, and it puts you into what's called the family editor. So I'm going to switch over to Revit right now, and I'm going to create a new family. And I wanted you to see that there are a variety of families that come with Revit. These are all templates. So you can have a casework template, a column template. Uh, if you scroll down, there's, here's an electrical fixture, fire alarm, furniture systems. There is a lot of generic models. So if something is not preset, like lighting fixture here, you can choose a generic model. And you can see that many of these have something like they're floor-based, line-based, face-based, face-based, say that 10 times fast, um, ceiling-based. Uh, you can create models for these, and if you, they can only then be put in, say, a ceiling or a floor or a roof or a wall. Uh, so it depends on the, what you're doing is how you want to add these or not. Well, since we're doing a bookcase, I'm going to choose the Furniture family and click Open. And it comes on up. We're in the Family Editor. As you can see here, the Create tab is the first one that, that's available. And you have different tools uh, that you can see, various tools that you have that are going to be specifically for families. You can tell with that we are actually in a furniture. Uh, family right here. The Omni class title is showing up uh, for general furniture and specialties. And we have some basic um, reference planes in here. Well, once we have the template, we need to go into the next step, which is actually creating a parametric framework. And the parametric framework is kind of like a skeleton. I uh, had to throw this one in since it's getting close to Halloween. Um, but it is true, a parametric framework is the skeleton for what you're going to build on top of it. 
So it is actually hosting all of the ligaments and the um, muscles and things like that, or in our case, the solid elements that are going to make up our bookcase. But you can still keep moving. The parametric framework is made up of reference planes, so you're going to add reference planes. Then you will dimension and label them. This is where the parametric comes out, the label is a parameter. And then you're going to flex the geometry. And this is critical at every point in the process of creating a family. You want to flex the geometry and make sure that it's working as you're expecting it to work. And then, of course, make changes if it's not working. Reference planes are a very powerful tool. You may have already used them in your projects because they can be used uh, anywhere in a Revit project. And in families, though, there's an, an important part of what we have, which is the origin. So you can see how there's the pen that's right up here. Those are pinned in place. So there will at least be two reference lines, or reference planes, sorry, two reference planes in the family that you can build off of, and they define the origin. You can change that, but in most cases, you just let that be the origin. Another thing you can do is you can name the reference planes. Uh, the, the origin ones will be named center, front, back, and I forget what the other one is. Uh, but they, they will have their those names. But you can, when you put in additional reference planes, you can name them and then use them in other views. So a very powerful tool as well. You don't need to re name every reference plane, but some will be very helpful to have them done. The next thing we need to do is add dimensions. So you can see I've got a dimension up here. I have a dimension that is equal. I can lock it. In this case, I'm not wanting to lock it because I want to be able to manipulate that one. But you will have a lock on all of your different dimensions so that you can you know, make sure that some stay put. The other thing you want to do is create labels. And you create labels from the dimension. So we actually will use the dimension and create a label, like this width one you see here. And that does make it a parameter, which then can be used in the type. And finally, you want to test the associations. So back up here, you can see I have in my, uh, when I've selected the dimension, I can use the temporary dimension and make a modification and make sure that all my reference planes are working together as I'm expecting them to. Another place that you go in creating the parametric framework is in the family type dialog box. And this is where you will have your full list of, of parameters. You can see right here this particular example has uh, a few right here. You can also set formulas. And this is an important part to have one parameter build off of another parameter. And therefore, they modify according to the sizes you're working with. And you can also flex these. So you can change the value right here and then hit the Apply button. So when you hit the Apply button, it'll take on whatever the information is in here. And typically, you'll put this to the side so you can see the uh, items that you're changing. Well, let's head back to Revit and do a, a quick demonstration. So here we are in my basic uh, furniture template that I've made. I am going to go ahead and save this as a bookcase. Always good to save. I probably should have done that first time. And I'm going to add, a different, uh, add additional reference planes. When I pick it, I'm just going to draw my reference plane. Doesn't really matter right now what the size is. I can use temporary dimensions. So for example, if I wanted this to be one foot, I actually can go ahead and use a temporary dimension. Um, if I don't want to, I don't have to do that. Now that I have them in, I want to get those constraints in there. So now I'm going to put in my dimensions and then make the labels. So I'm starting the dimension command right up here. And first of all, I'm going to do my uh, equals. It's always good to get those set up first. 
So here's a, my dimensions across there, and I'm going to make that equal. And I'm going to do the same thing here and make that equal. And you can see it, that one is special. You can see the change in when I made it equal. And then I'm going to create overall dimensions for both of these. Now, in this case, it, this one came out nicely at two because I had um, preset one of them. Um, this one is odd numbers, but we'll get that fixed in just a minute. To make a label, I select a dimension, and then I come up here into the options bar to the label button, and I click Add Parameter. It brings up the parameter properties. It tells me I'm making a family parameter. Right now, I want to make a type parameter because this is going to be something that's in the type that I'm working on. And I'm going to name this one width. Now, I'm going to tell you more about the rest of the choices. Right now, I'm just going to uh, click OK, and I have my parameter. I'm going to do the same thing with this dimension here. Label it, add parameter right up here. I'm going to name this one depth and click OK. Now I want to go ahead and test and make sure these are working OK. And here's a quick way to do it. Here's my width. I'm going to make this foot 4 foot. And you can see very quickly everything cleaned up fairly nicely. I'm going to now go into my project browser over here and uh, select the front view. Oh, and, and actually, before that, let me go ahead and do this. I'm going to type in WT. That did a window tile. All of these are automatically open when you are, are open the family. So, but you just didn't see them because I was just showing you the, the one that was on top. And I'm typing ZA so that everything zoomed in. For this uh, uh, example, I'm going to go ahead and just close this bookcase. That was the one on the left or right. I don't need that at the moment. And I'm going to expand my 3D view. And you can see in the 3D view, nothing's showing because reference planes do not show in 3D views. But now I can see here's my, front, uh, my, my plan view and here's my elevation view. I'm going to go ahead and maximize my elevation view and zoom in here and do a little bit of work here. I'm going to come back to Create. I'm going to go to Reference Plane. And um, by the way, if you notice up here, there's, it says RP, so you can shortcut uh, for Reference Plane. You can actually click that. I'm going to start by making a short Reference Plane at the bottom. I'm going to say that this, I want it to be 4 inches. And I'm going to zoom in here just a minute. I'm going to make this dimension permanent. So there I actually have a permanent dimension. Now remember I said that you can lock dimensions. Here's one I want to lock. I'm not going to be changing this. It's always going to stay the four inches. So I want to go ahead and lock that so nothing else uh, gets in the way. Go back to my reference planes, and now I'm going to add in the shelves. So each of these reference plane is going to be a shelf because I'm going to use my uh, uh, labels and such, I don't need to worry about uh, how far apart they are. I'm going to come on in and dimension. Now, in this case, I'm going to dimension each of the reference planes separately. So you can see here, each of these are going to be separate. And then I'm going to have one overall dimension that's going to be my height. And as you'll see, I can actually make one label and apply it many times. First of all, let me go ahead and make my label for my height. So I'm adding the parameter for the height. And then I'm going to come and select one of these. I'm going to label this, um, and again, adding a parameter. And this is going to be the shelf height. And by the way, notice, I, again, I'm doing types. These are things that are going to be happening within the family, not each time you insert one. 
when I have one shelf height, I can go ahead and select these other two dimensions and actually, instead of adding a parameter, apply that parameter right there, shelf height. We still have some problems. Our height and our shelf height aren't working together, so this particular dimension here is not correct. And that's where a formula comes in. So I'm going to come up here to my family types. And in here, I'm going to do a, a formula for my shelf height. And I want that to be the height divided by 4. Now, as I type that in, it is critical that you are using the exact same parameter name. It can't, if I had misspelled height and put in H-I-E, which has happened, <laughs> um, and I put in H-E-I here, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't find that parameter. And even if I had done a lowercase h, it wouldn't find the parameter. So you need to make sure that your parameters are spelled right as you want them. I typically use title case so that I know what I'm always going to be using. Uh, you can check at your office if there's any specific way they want parameters uh, designed. Now, watch over on my right-hand side over here. When I pick Apply, my shelf heights modified. They are now following the height, one quarter of the height. And of course, I have a strange height here, so let's change that. Let's be five feet. Apply. You can see the shelf height automatically changed here. And over here, it also changed as well. I'm going to click OK. So that's a basic of putting in reference planes, adding dimensions, locking some dimensions, making some dimensions equal, and also applying the um, labels to the dimensions, as you can see here. Just a quick question, Kareem, do we have any questions from anybody about what I've done so far? Hi, Martha. No, I don't see anything uh, to date so far. Okay. Good, good. And if you would go ahead, type questions in there, and uh, you know, if some come up, I will um, ask again uh, later. And then at the end of it, we will also answer any questions. Whoops. Okay, back to the demonstration. Here we go. N the next thing we need to do in the family creation is add elements. And there are a number of kind of elements that you can add, uh, both 2D and 3D. But what I want to focus on today are our forms, extrusion blend, revolve sweep, and swept blend. Now, all of these can be made solid, or they can also be made void. So you can create them and put them inside of another solid form. But let's look at how each of these are made. Extrusions are created by drawing a profile and giving it a height. So here you can see the pro on the left you can see my profile, and then you can see the extruded solid with whatever height was specified for this one. By far and away, extrusions are the ones I've used the most. So it might depend on what it is you are designing, uh, but I, extrusions are probably the most used type. Another option is called a blend. And it actually is made up of two profiles. So you have one profile at one level, another profile at a different level, or in this case, maybe I should say height, because they don't have to be at different levels, though they can be. And then when you create them, it's going to be, it automatically comes in and brings in all of the forms that are needed, um, so from one height to another. And you can modify where these intersect as well. It's a very, very powerful tool, the blends. Revolves are also made with a profile, so no surprise there. I think everything is. Um, but this one you have now an axis, like you see here, and then you specify how far you want it to be re revolved. In this case, over here, you can see that as a full revolve. We did a full 360, so you can do any amount that, that you need to. One thing when you are adding these elements you need to be rem um, remember is to be in the right view. So for example, to get the revolved solid that I have over here, I needed to make sure I was in an elevation view 
to create my profile and assign my axis. If I had been in a plan view, it would have given me something more like a wheel, so like off of a car or something like that. So do be aware of what view you're in when you're creating the various elements. The next one is called a sweep, and the sweeps have a profile. You can see right over here is our profile. And it has a path. So instead of, a, it's still one profile, instead of just putting in a, a height, you can actually specify the path along which you want it to go. And it takes that profile and just sweeps it around. And our final one is very similar to that. It's a sweep, but you can have two different types of profiles here. As you can see, just a simple one. I have the circle over here and a rectangle over here. Here's my path, and it sweeps from one profile to the other. Very, Again, very, very powerful tools. And depending on what it is you are designing, you can use all of these different uh, choices within your family. Martha? Yes. Someone did just ask a question that maybe you'd like to address right now. Okay. Uh, it's related. They asked if you are limited to two profiles. Oh, like a loft. So um, right now, I don't know about making a loft. Okay. So we'll you know, it's, it's really bad. I'm think I know you can do it in AutoCAD. <laughs> it's really bad. I don't. So far as I know, you can't do that in Revit right now. But that is, I will check and make sure that that's true. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Actually, one thing we can we can do a quick check here. Uh, take a look here. No, no, no options for other forms right now. And so here's all my voids. You can see here. So it looks like there is no way to make a loft at the moment. Just an aside: if you are doing that, you can make a um, item like within. Inventor or AutoCAD and bring it in as a mass element, I think. So there's some, some ways you can actually do it, but it, it might just be you'd have to build the loft yourself from several um, forms. But that would be a good, good question to find out more about, too. All right, let me go ahead and put some extrusions in. I'm going to start in my plan view right here, ref level view. I'm going to create an extrusion. I like to, as often as possible, use my rectangle command because it is just quicker, the way you can do things. And I'm going to come here and make sure I am selecting the intersections here of my reference planes. Very important to have those intersections. And then I want to lock my extrusion to those intersections. So again, very, very important to align and lock the, the um, items to your reference plane. That way, when you modify the width or the depth or whatever, it will automatically be correct. Now up here, I'm going to change my depth to four inches because that's what I want it to be. This is the base that I'm working on. So I'm going to say four inches. And then I'm going to finalize this with finish edit mode up here. So this is a very simple one. Oops. Oh, and I just closed it. I didn't mean to close it. Excuse me. There we go. I wanted everything to, to be seen. And also notice over here in my 3D view, let's get here. There we go wanted to get my 3D view. You can see the base. I'm going to go ahead and shade this so you can see that it is a, a hard copy of, or a hard object. And I'm going to do the same up here and get that shaded. This would be more of a problem in this one, but this one can I can shade. Now before I go much further, I want to make sure that this, even though I said it was going to be four inches, and you can see here is my depth up here, it says four inches, or even here, extrusion end, all sorts of places you can set it. Um, I need to make sure it stays that way by aligning and locking it. 
So I'm going to pick align, my align command. I want to align it to this reference plane, select bad extrusion, it's called the shape handle, and then lock it. So it's going to be locked in place. I'm going to do the bottom one as well. Go ahead and select the reference plane, select this, and lock it. Now on the ends, it's actually already controlled by the other part of the, um, sorry, from the other view. Okay. Now I'm going to do just a quick version of the uh, bookcase just so we can, since we have time, it would actually take quite a bit of time to put in all the reference planes that are needed. So I'm just going to do a quick outline of the bookcase and get everything in place there so you can see that. Once again, I am using my solid extrusion command, and I'm going to use rectangle. I'm picking my corner, and you can see I want to make sure my reference planes are highlighting there. It's getting, there we go, my intersection, and lock them. Once again, always remember as soon as you draw something to lock it into place. And then I'm going to stay in the rectangle but I'm going to give an offset of minus 2 inches. So right up here I'm typing in minus 2 inches. And this allows me to use the same intersections, but you can see it's doing it 2 inches inside. And it automatically locks, because in this place I actually chose it against the other elements. So it's automatically locked to the other element. In reality, I would have gone ahead and added some more reference planes for this, but in this case, like I said, it's just to make it a little bit easier and speedy for today. So I'm going to click Finish Edit Mode. There you can see the outline. Let's minimize that. Now we have much more of a bookcase, but it's still not exactly right. And that's because we kept the depth of the four inches before, and it wasn't necessarily really the depth that we need. And in this case, we're going to make it the entire base. So let's just zoom in here. And I'll show you another way that you can align and lock. This is the bookcase uh, frame right now selected. I can use these shape handles and drag them up. Did you see how it actually connected to that? And I can lock it. So I can use the align command and select align and lock, or I can actually use these shape handles. But once again, don't forget to lock them in place. Now I come back and I have my bookcase as expected. Now at this point, I would start using all of my shelf uh, lines here, I'd add some additional reference lines to get the shelves in place, to get the back in place, and other items. But for right now, so that you can understand the process of, of adding the extrusions, I'm just going to stop right there. Okay, so once you have all the elements in place, then you can create the types. And the types are going to be what you see in the type selector. So here's one that comes with Revit. There's a desk. There's actually three different types that are available. Uh, and in this case, they're named by the size. And that is frequently a method, though in other cases it might not be. It just kind of depends on what it is you are using uh, on how you name it. And again, also check back with your office to see how they want to have things named. When you're creating types, you can also create additional parameters. Now, this can actually be done at any point in the process if there are parameters that aren't connected directly to items. You can go ahead and create the parameters at any point in time. And you go into the Family Types dialog box and set, say, add a new parameter. And we want at this time to make family parameters. So we they aren't going to appear in schedules or tags. They're just being used within. Um, there is something called a shared parameter that can be used in multiple projects and families, and that is for another webcast. It, it's a very complex process, 
but again, very powerful as long as you're careful to make sure everything is put together correctly. I always choose whether I'm going to make a type or an instance parameter first because a lot of times I forget. In earlier versions, you couldn't change this, but in 2015, you can edit the parameters and change whether it's a type or an instance. That's wonderful. That's a very nice addition. Um, but in the past, you had to delete it and make it back. So if anyone is using something before maybe 2014, uh, you can't make, I think it is maybe 15, you can only do it. Uh, once. In this case, I'm going to make a p material parameter and I'm going to make it an instance parameter. That allows somebody to place the bookcase into a project several times using several different types, but then they can assign what material they want separately. So that's just an example in this case. Then I'm going to go ahead and, and add in the name. I select a discipline, and this discipline can be any of the types of disciplines. I'll show you that in just a minute. And whatever the discipline is, the list of parameters, the types, will be modified. And you can group parameters under items. So in this case, it's automatically assuming you're doing a material. So we're going to leave it in materials and finishes. And this is something that's new in 2015. You can actually add a tooltip to a parameter, which is really a, a lovely thing to be able to do. Now once you do have all your parameters in place, you can make family types. And when you're doing that, you're coming over here into this family type section. Before, uh, to make the parameter, you're down here in this section. But here you'll be in the family type section and do a new one. You'll, it'll come up and ask you for the name, and again, remind you to go back and check whatever your office standards are to make sure you're naming these things correctly. And then you come in and specify the sizes. I do warn you that whatever you type in the name doesn't necessarily automatically take place in the values of the parameters, so you have to be careful to make sure you are choosing the right parameters and the right name at the same time. And when you pick apply, it automatically places those. So let's look at that. We'll create a parameter oops, and, and also make some types. So once again, I'm coming into uh, this. I'm going to make to go into my family types. I'm going to add a parameter, first of all, add. And I'm going to call this a bookcase material. Whoops, and here I told you I always pick whether it's an instance or a type first. Ah, forgot. So anyway, it's an instance. Uh, I'm going to call this my bookcase material. It's a common discipline, but you can see that there are other disciplines that you can work with. And I'm going to make it a material. These are all the common parameters that you would find if I had selected, you know, just let me show you real quick. If I had selected electrical, so you've got all sorts of electrical parameter types that you can choose from. Or if I had chosen structural, there's all sorts of structural types that you can choose from. So again, I'm going back to common. I'm going to make it material. I'm going to edit the tooltip and say select a material for the bookcase and click OK. Click OK. You can see here in my group above, I have now my, my bookcase material is set up. It also says the value is by category. That's what I want right now because I'm going to have it actually apply it by in the project. My next step in this dialog box is to create a family type. So I'm coming over here to Family Types, and I'm clicking New. I'm going to name this first one 3 foot by 5 foot. And right now you can see my numbers don't match that, so I'd better come in here and make that 3 foot. And see that this height is correct, that's 5 foot. I'm going to hit Apply. And you can see how it resized over here in my 3D view. 
So that, that's giving me that first family type. I'm going to do one that's three foot six inches by five foot zero inches. Click OK. And in this case, all I need to do is change that and hit Apply. You can see again it changed in width. I'm going to do two more. So I'm going to do a, what did I call it, three foot by six foot. And change here, let's see, six feet. This is three feet. And do remember that you need to make sure you're getting it to match the right um, information. And to apply. And then I'm going to do one last one, and I'm going to do three foot six by six feet. And one last time, changing the appropriate parameter and applying it. And you can see again the height now has changed and my shelf height has changed because when I changed the height, the shelf height changed. To test them, I always like to go back and check each one. So here's three foot, foot by five. Yep, went down nice and small. Here's the one by six. Up, oh, got taller, there's good. So I'm, I'm checking each of the ones to make sure that I've got the right sizes. And of course, if once I put in all the shelves and other items as well, it would give me the information that I need. One last step I need to take at this point is to associate that material parameter with my extrusions. So in this case, I want both of these to be the same. I'm selecting my extrusions. And you can see an option for extrusion is material. Again, I'm going to leave it by category here, but I'm going to come over and select this. I want to associate it with that new family parameter that I just made. So material comes with the extrusion option, but this associate lets me choose exactly what it's going to go with. And here I want it to associate with my bookcase material Click OK, and then I can go ahead and save this. So it's nice and fine. I've been doing all this, this work within my family, but I need to make sure that this is going to work in a project. So let me create a new project very quickly. Just do architectural. So I'm making a new project. I'm then um, hitting Control-Tab to take me back to my previous view. So if you didn't know that, that's a great tool. Control plus tab switches between open views. I'm going to load this into the project. And you can see over here my bookcase is actually available. So let me go ahead and put in several bookcases. I'm going to use my different types. So there you can see various types that I have. Here's another type. And the final one. Hit Modify to stop that. So there's my, my several bookcases. Let me just get them a little bit closer here. Whoops, and I just opened that. What I did, by the way, was I didn't mean to, but I double-clicked on it. And uh, by default, it actually opens and edits the family. Um, I would actually change that. In my version of Revit, you can change that in options of what what happens when you double click on something? And while you're making a family, it's really nice to double click on it and it opens the family type. But in reality, most people do not want you touching their families. So we don't want you touching families. So I would turn that off so it would not give you the information. So here's my bookcases. I'm going to change my visual style to realistic and now go ahead and apply my instance parameter there it is, bookcase material by category. I'm going to click on that and select the button here. This brings up my material browser. I'm going to do some wood ones here. So here's cherry. Let's go ahead and assign cherry to this one. There you can see it's assigned cherry. 
just another quick one real quick just so you can see that they definitely are different. Um, here's walnut. Let's bring walnut up into here and use walnut. And you can see I've got a different material on. So that's, that's how you, it's a double thing that you need to do with that material. You needed to not only create it in the um, parameters, but you also needed to go ahead and create it in, uh, and assign it to, so not only in the family types, but then assign it also to the elements, uh, in this case, the extrusions. So what we've done today is we've gone through the basic family creation workflow. We have selected the template we needed. We set up the parametric framework with the reference planes, dimensions, and labels. We flexed the geometry. Then we added some elements, in this case extrusions, created some types, and then we used it in a project. And of course, once again, to take more time, we would have added in the shelves and everything. Um, in the actual book, you go through and you add shelves, and you also add on the uh, additional window over top of each of the shelves. So just a little bit about our training guides. As I mentioned, this one that we just uh, took this from is our BIM management class right up here at the very top. And it is for architecture, Revit architecture, Revit structure, and Revit MEP. So there are examples and practices from all the disciplines in both the BIM management book and collaboration tools. Collaboration tools is the one that has uh, work sharing and linking, uh, importing and exporting groups, things like that. We have three books for specifically for Revit architecture, our fundamentals book, Conceptual design and visualization, which includes massing studies as well as all your different viewing tools and rendering, uh, and also in rooms, so for uh, space planning. And then a short book, which is Site and Structure, which goes through the basic site and structure tools used in Revit architecture. Now, of course, we do have uh, fundamentals books for our Revit MEP and Revit Structure as well. So that goes into the full uses of all of the various uh, tools that you have that are specific to those as well. So, Corrine, I'm going to okay. turn it back to you, and you can tell us a bit more about Perfect. Yes, thanks, Rhonda. Uh, Martha, sorry about that. I just wanted to let everyone know uh, or remind you that all of uh, the books that Martha just told us about are available in a printed spiral-bound format. We have electronic ebook format. We have instructor tools, which are a really helpful aid if you are tasked with teaching the class. And we also have a Revit Architecture eLearning Bundle, which really gives you an online access to five of our Revit Architecture uh, books that have been formatted specifically for online learning, and you get access to that for a full year by subscription. So it's really great if, you've, uh, if you want to do self-paced learning, if you don't want to leave your, to go to a class, that's really ideal. Okay, so all those are all the different formats, and you can purchase all of this uh, at our ascentestore.com, so right online. And Martha, if you go to that next slide, we'll see that website and all our information. Perfect. So the first website there, that's our e-store. So all the purchases can be made directly on there. But of course, if you want to talk to us, we'd love to hear from you. So I put in our information there for to give us a call. We've got an email address there, for feedback at ascented.com. We do like to hear your feedback, uh, of course, on our courseware on the products and services that we offer, and on any maybe upcoming topics we'd like to hear about uh, from Martha or from any of our other authors. I think, Martha, you had a few topics already up your sleeve there when you were <laughs> right. uh, going through your presentation, so make note of those. But we're also on social media, so we have our Twitter account, and we have a blog, and I did mention earlier that Martha is one of our contributors to the blog, so she has her own blog set up there, so I encourage you to follow her. She'll give you... Um, you know, the latest news as to what's new in the books that she's writing. Her very latest blog is actually a video that's promoting uh, her class coming up at Autodesk University. And sometimes, since she might do a follow-up to this webcast, she'll put in a blog there to answer the questions that come through. Okay, so thanks everyone for your time today.